Welcome to the Perry Plains Church of Christ and Friends Bible Study today on June the 7th of 2020. Do you remember this phrase, come on down? It is best known for the game show, The Price is Right. Contestants are selected from the studio audience and the announcer states the show's famous catchphrase, Come on down. And when their name is called, they act as if they've already won a million dollars. It was just worth watching this program to see the reactions of the people. Think about it for a minute. In this life, we have been called to come on down with decisions to make. Decisions are being made in our lives at the present time and they will be being made throughout the rest of our lives. Do you remember this program also? Let's make a deal. Is it behind door number one, door number two, or door number three? In James chapter one, Satan is trying to make a deal with us. You don't know what is behind door number one. You do not know what's behind door number two or door number three. You don't even know the price sometimes that you'll be paying to see what is behind that door. And what God has been trying to reveal to us in James chapter one, what the price will cost us. Satan's trying to make that deal. He dangles this desire in front of us to arouse our lust in our hearts and in our minds. And if we allow it to stay there, we don't look for that door of escape. That desire grows. And it grows. And you reach out and you partake of it. And do you know what you have just purchased? This is what the devil does not want you to understand, but it's what God wants Billy to understand in his life. What you have obtained is death. Do you know what you've traded for death? You have traded your soul. He's saying, Billy, you've, you've traded eternal life for this pleasure in this life. You see, God doesn't leave us with the one option that Satan gives us. He wants us to understand what's involved when we sin. Going back to James 1, 13 through 15. Let no man say when he is tempted, he is tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You remember the devil and Daniel Webster? Well, there was a farmer who lived in the small town of Cross Corners, New Hampshire, called Jabez Stone. He is plagued with bad luck day in and day out. And finally, he makes a statement that he eventually regrets. He says, It's enough to make a man want to sell his soul to the devil. Stone is visited the next day by a stranger who later identifies himself, himself as Mr. Scratch. And he makes an offer to exchange seven years of prosperity for Mr. Stone's soul. And he agrees. And after seven years, Mr. Scratch comes for Mr. Stone's soul. Stone bargains for an additional three years. Those three years pass, and Mr. Scratch returns. And he refuses to give any further instruction. You see, Mr. Stone wanted out of the deal. And he finally convinces 
this famous lawyer and orator, Daniel Webster, to accept his case and to defend him. Jabez Stone knew the deal he had made with Mr. Scratch. The fulfillment of his desire, those years of plenty for his soul. You see, the devil doesn't work that way in reality. He doesn't want us to know the result of us taking his bait that he dangles in front of us. He knows what will appeal to our lust of the flesh, our lust of the eyes, and our pride of life. He knows the flavor of sin to bait his hook with, to cover his bait. And that's why we have had lessons on look for the hook. And what that hook is baited with, it will always be appealing unto us. Don't be fooled. If you take what Satan offers, God wants us to know, wants you to know, wants me to know what we've given away, what we have exchanged for that pleasure. And that is our soul. In James chapter 1, verse 17, as we studied last week, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. In essence, James writes what God wants us to understand about gifts in life. And there's two different types of gifts. There's one which is perfect and good. One that is for our benefit. For the betterment of us spiritually. And it, they come from above. And they continue to flow from above. From the Father of lights. The other gifts, however, come from our adversary. Who cares nothing about us. He, oh, he gives us things that we desire. He gives us things that we want. And we have pleasure with those things. But there's a catch here for a short period of time. But we're selling out our soul to do so. Just as with two different gifts from two different sources, there are two gates. There's the straight, the narrow gate, versus a broad, wide gate. There's two paths. There's a narrow path, a narrow road. And there is a wide way, or a wide road. A In Matthew 7, verse 13 through 14, listen to what he states. Jesus said, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. The past three or four weeks, I've had a few funerals, three memorials. And Jesus is trying to get us to understand that everybody's not going to heaven. I've never been to a funeral or a memorial where anyone... would say that someone went to hell. I mean, even if it was true, I would not say that. But what is Jesus telling us here? He says there's more people going to hell than there is heaven. Look at the verses again, verse 13 and 14. But now what I want us to see is, is there's one of two ways. One leads to destruction versus one that leads to life. The one that leads to destruction is easy to choose. It's easy to walk down because its gate is broad, it's wide, its path is the same. But the other is more difficult. It requires effort for it is narrow. It requires discipline. 
you'll have to give up something to walk down both paths. Either we will give it up now or we will give it up in eternity. Either you will give your life to Jesus today, be totally committed to Him, putting the kingdom of God first, Matthew 6.33, so that in the future we can have that abode in heaven, eternal life. The road's not going to be easy. It's going to be difficult. Or we can enjoy the pleasures of sin for a time, for a season. And what we give in exchange for that is our soul. We will give up eternal life. Now in our text, in James chapter 1, And if you look at verse 18, we see that the Word of God versus the Word of the devil as we look at the context of this chapter. He says the Word of God is truthful. It's the Word of truth, verse 18. In John 17, 17, Jesus said, Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. I'm sorry, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. In John 16, 13, howbeit when he say that the Spirit of truth has come, he will guide you to all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he shall show you things to come. The Spirit of truth guided men to know the will of God inspired them. And we have men who wrote the Word of God down so that it could be revealed to us. On the other hand, the devil, his word is lies. They're deceitful and so forth. Oh yes, he does offer you pleasure. He offers us fun today. And, let me, and if someone tells you that, fun, that sin is not fun, they need to have their head examined because it is. And I'm not saying all sin is fun. I've never understood what, any, what anyone gets out of the pleasure of having a drunken stupor where they're vomiting their guts out and sick the next day. I know being in the military, I had a guy above me that would go out and get drunk and he would puke and he was on the bunk above me. Why doesn't Satan reveal the bad things about sin unto us? I don't know. Why doesn't he reveal to us that the pleasure of sin is only temporary? I don't know. I know he's a liar. I know he's deceitful. It's like taking a drug. It, maybe it doesn't take much for a person to get high the first time, but after a while, after you've taken the drug for a while, what do you have to do? You have to take <coughs> excuse me, a little bit more of it, a little bit more of it, a little bit more of it to get the same type of high that you've gotten before. Oh, it's fun time, but for a season... Whatever the sin is, you can become addicted to. But it is pleasurable, as you see in Hebrews 11.25. But Moses made a decision. He had two paths he could have taken. He could have taken the broad way. He could have taken the easy path. being Pharaoh's son. Or, and the, and the decision that he made was to stay with God's people and to suffer affliction with them for a season instead of pleasure for a season because he wanted to have pleasure for eternity instead of damnation for eternity. 
Satan is the father of lies. There is no truth in him. In John 8, verse 44, it says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and, the, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. He is the original liar here in this world. Satan told the first lie recorded in history to Eve in the Garden of Eden. After planting the seeds of doubt in Eve's mind with the question, he directly con contradicts God's Word by telling her, you shall not certainly die in verse 4. Oh, Satan's good at it. He's a master at it. He puts doubts in our mind. He casts doubts in our minds whether or not God's Word is accurate, whether or not God's Word is truthful. God, and Satan succeeds in it. There's people that leave God because they begin to doubt His Word. Lying and deception is Satan's primary weapons against God's children. He uses the tactic of deceit to separate people from their Heavenly Father. Some of the most common lies that are used, there is no God. Oh, that's the deceit and lies that He wants us to believe. God doesn't care about you. The Bible cannot be trusted. And He says you can earn your way into heaven. All these are lies. He's not going to tell you the truth. The Apostle Paul tells us that Satan masquerades himself as an angel of light. He makes himself sound good, sound reasonable, sound wonderful in his ways. But it is nothing more than a false appearance, a masquerade, a mask, a fake, a lie. Look at 2 Corinthians 11.4. He says, don't marvel. For Satan himself can be transformed or masquerades himself or disguises himself as an angel of light. Adolf Hitler, a man who learned how to lie very effectively, once said, if you tell a big enough lie and tell it frequently enough, it will be believed. You tell a lie enough, you will begin to believe it. And then when you believe it, you can convince others to believe it. Life versus death in James 1. God wants us to know that if we partake of the desires that is awakened in our hearts by the different baits Satan dangles in front of us, it will lead to death. Look at verse 15. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, when it is completed, when it is perfect, when it matures, brings forth death. Then our S says, when that desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And that sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. If you remember Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. There's only one thing in life that we can earn spiritually, and that's spiritual death. We can't earn spiritual life. But we can earn spiritual death. He says the wages of sin is death. We can see and we can understand from James 1 that the birth of sin and how it matures and produces death in our lives in contrast we can be born again into life instead of death. Isn't this one of the most important gifts that we can receive? 
He says, these gifts cometh down. They're continually coming down from above. From the Father of lights, with whom there's no verbless or shadow of turning. In Romans 6.23, it says, For the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We can experience a new birth in life. Look at James chapter 1, verse 18. Of His own will begat He us. The New American Bible says He willed to give us birth. The NIV says He chose to give us birth. And the NRS says in fulfillment of His own purpose, He gave us birth. We can experience this new birth. Why do we need a new birth, someone asks. It's because we're dead. And we need to be awakened. I'm not talking about physically dead right now. It's an impossibility for those that are physically dead to become spiritually alive again. Or we can become physically dead and then we can become, we will have that bodily resurrection as we've been studying in 1 Corinthians 15 for the past several weeks on Wednesday nights. We need a new birth because we're dead. We're spiritually dead. Have we not been reading the same passages in James chapter 1? That when sin is brought forth and when it is completed, it brings forth death, it brings forth spiritual death? What does Romans chapter 3 verse 9 and 10 state? It says, What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. We are Gentiles today. The majority of us, I would say. 99% of us are. And he says, I have proven, Paul says, I have proven that both Jew and Gentile are under sin. There's none righteous. We can't stand before God with our own righteousness and God accept us. Our own righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. And in Romans 3, verse 23, it says, For we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every one of us is a sinner. Why do we need to be Begotten, why do we need God to begat us? Why do we need to be born again? Because we're spiritually dead. Because we have sinned in our lives. And if you remember Isaiah chapter 59 verse 2, as the result of our iniquities, as a result of the sins in our lives, remember death is a separation. Whether we're talking about physical death or spiritual death. Physical death is when the spirit leaves the body and returns unto God who gave it. Physic, that's physical death. Spiritual death is when we're separated from God. And can you imagine, as you read in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10, that that e eternal death, that second death, that that Separation from the very, not only from the very presence, but from the glory of His power, what that's going to be like, I cannot comprehend. But notice Isaiah 59 2 is the result of our sins, we have died spiritually. But your iniquities have separated who? Me from God. You from God. Us from God. Our individual sins. The soul that sinneth. It shall die, Ezekiel 18.20. The Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father, neither shall the Father bear the iniquity of the Son. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Remember, God is light, and in Him is no darkness. God has no fellowship with darkness. And when we live in darkness, God has no fellowship with us. 
He's hid his face from us. We are separated from him. So we need to be born again. We need to have that new birth. This word begat in James 1.18, according to Strong's, it means to breed forth, that is by uh, transformation, to generate. Thayer says to bring forth, give birth to, produce. Vines says to give birth to, is used metaphorically, of a spiritual birth. This m recalls to my mind very quickly the words of Jesus found in John chapter 3, verse 3 and verse 5. Listen to these words. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? They knew that was an impossibility. Look at what Jesus says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. We must be born again. That's what James 1.18 tells us. We need to be born again as the result of the sins in our life. The sins in our life causes us to die spiritually. We need to be brought back to life. By what means is that possible? How can that take place? According to James chapter 1, verse 18, it says, by the word of truth. Of His own will begat He us with the word of truth. The New King James Version says, of His own will He brought us forth by the word of truth. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it says the Word of God. Notice what it says. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Peter, just as Jesus, in Matthew 13 and in Luke 8, talking about the prayer of the sower, states that the seed is the Word of God. Notice what he says here in Peter. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed. What is that incorruptible seed? It is the Word of God, which continues to live. The NAS says, For you've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and abiding Word of God. DNLT says, for you have been born again. Your new life did not come from your earthly parents because the life they gave you will end in death. But this new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living Word of God. Going back to John 3, verses 3 through 5, you remember what Jesus said? Except a man be born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Who revealed the mind of God unto us, the will of God unto us. It was the Spirit. You go back and read 1 Corinthians. The Spirit searched the mind of God and revealed it unto Paul and to the others in the first century. We're to be born of the Word. We're to be born of the Spirit. We're to be born of the water, which is water baptism. A new birth does not occur without some, the knowledge of the Word of God. How can we know what God expects us to do to have a right relationship with Him without the Word of God? We're born again by the Word of God. By this seed that's incorruptible. That lives and abides forever. The Word of God is described as the seed from which Christians come. In the parable of the sower, Jesus described the seed as the Word of God as going into the soil, the soil being the hearts of men and women. When, just as if there's different soils on this earth. Men and women have different hearts. Different kinds of hearts. And let me tell you the kind of heart that is receptive unto the Word of God and brings forth fruit. Brings forth good things. 
It is the honest heart. You go back and read the parable of the soul in Luke chapter 8. If you don't get anything else from James chapter 1, verse 18 today, get this. Try to understand this. There is no chance of being born again without the Scriptures. There is no chance of becoming a child of God without the Word of Truth. Oh, Satan is going to try to throw deception and lies, traditions of men, the ideas of men for us to follow. How do we know whether it's traditions of men and ideas of men? By the Word of God. If, let me tell you something. If any, Even if an angel was to appear unto us today, you go back and read Galatians 1, 6-8, even if an angel was to appear to us and teach us a different gospel other than the one that Paul taught, other than the one that is revealed in the Word of God, the Word of truth, he says, don't believe it. He says, let that angel be anathema. Let that angel be accursed. Some people claim they've had some type of religious experience and they could tell by their feelings that they were saved. What is, brethren, friends, I want us to look at James 1. What does James 1 tell us? What does he tell us in verse 18? He quite plainly states that the new birth comes by the Word of Truth. So we've got to study the Word of God to know what's pleasing unto God. Being born again doesn't come from feelings, from experiences, or from a direct action of God upon the person. It comes from following the Word of God. Not the notions, the preconceived ideas of the traditions of men. Proverbs 14, 12 tells us there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Jeremiah 10, 23 tells us that it is not within man to direct his steps. In Isaiah chapter 55, verses 8 through 11, God says, My ways are not your ways, and your thoughts are not my thoughts. We need to get back to the truth. God's Word is truth. God's Word is what we are to hear and what we are to obey. Now, if you'll notice James 1, 18, it says, of His own will. It is of His own will that He wants us to be born again. God wants us to be saved by His Word. Do you see this? That's why it is so important for us. What, why did Jesus tell His disciples do? As He was ready to ascend into heaven, to go into all the world and what? To teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And to continue to teach them what? The things that they've been taught. Continue to teach them the things that they were going to be taught by the Holy Spirit to lead all men into truth. And that's why we're to go and teach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. Why would a non-believer be baptized? He wouldn't be. That's why he didn't have to say, he that believeth not and is baptized not shall not be saved. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Same context, to go ye and to teach and to preach to every creature here that is on earth. God wants us to be saved. Second Peter 3, 9. God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth? There's another thing which you notice in verse 18. There's going to be a great harvest. That we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. 
What does first fruits imply? It's going to be a great harvest. A great harvest. What part of this today? As you go back and you read the book of Acts in the first century, you will read that multitudes of people, people will be multiplied in the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Those that were, be, were being added to the Lord, those that were being added to the church by the Lord were the ones that were being saved, Acts 2.47. And it was those that were receiving the Word of God and they were repenting of their sins and being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, Acts 2, verse 38. And the reason they did it because they were pricked in their hearts and knew that they were sinners before God and they knew that they had been separated from God and that they needed their sin problem taken care of, Acts 2, 37 through 47. Look at this chart with me for a second. Jesus died. He was buried. And he was resurrected. That is the gospel that Paul proclaimed to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse, verses 1 through 4. That is what they received. That is what they were saved by, unless they believed in vain. We today are to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, Romans 1, 16. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. Someone asked, well, how do we obey the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus? It is in baptism, Romans chapter 6, verse 3 and verse 4. In Romans chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, he says, We have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to us. What is that form of doctrine? The word form is pattern. He says, what was that pattern? It was the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Well, how did we obey that form of doctrine in water baptism? Oh, what did Jesus say in John 3? You must be born again of the water and of the Spirit in order to see in order to enter into the kingdom of God. How are we born again? By the word of God, James 1.18. How are we born again? By the incorruptible word of God is what Peter stated to us. Paul, said, Paul says that God be thanked. We were the servants of sins. We were the servants of sin. But now we're the servants of righteousness. Why? Because we've obeyed that form of doctrine from our heart. Yes, our heart is to be involved in obeying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brethren, are we standing, friends, are we standing in the gospel of Jesus Christ today? Don't tell me that God, the kind of God that we have today, a God such as ours, would do all of this for us and then lead us in temptation and then lead us into, into sin? No way. No way. Let no man say when he's tempted. He's tempted God. For God cannot be tempted. Neither doth he tempt it. any man. I want to thank you for listening today. Let's open up the Word of God. Let's study it. And let's obey the Word of God. Not the ideas of men, not the feelings of men, but the unadulterated Word of God. Thank you.